During college, Lauren Yero found a way to marry up her interests in creative writing and ecological science. A handful of years later, Yero wed both those commitments into her debut novel for young adults, titled Under This Forgetful Sky. I didn't sit down and say, I want to write a book that talks about climate change and has this agenda and this is the story that I'm going to map onto that agenda. It was, I have this idea for this story. I have these characters. I'm figuring out how their world came to be and how they come together and what the arc of their story is. And a climate altered world is just the backdrop of their reality. I'm Matt Pikin, and this is The Overlook, a podcast about the news, arts, issues, and trends of Asheville, North Carolina. My guest today is Lauren Euro, who grew up in Central Florida, but since 2015 has lived with her husband and now two young kids on a budding hobby farm in Madison County. We talk about threading her concerns with climate change into a near-future fantasy set in Chile. We also get into the thick of her creative process, turning disparate kernels of ideas and dreams into a cohesive story, and also why she only sprinkled in slivers of Spanish onto a story featuring South American characters, but told in English. Hey, Overlook audience, did you know that every month I produce more than 400 minutes of exclusive local content relevant to life in Asheville? The Overlook is a one-man band, well, along with the fantastic, generous guests I invite onto the show, but my point is I'm delivering something Asheville has never had before. If you value The Overlook, if it makes you a more informed and engaged citizen, consider joining my Patreon campaign. You can be a sustaining member for as little as five dollars a month. Your support would mean the world to me. To learn more, go to patreon.com slash the overlook podcast. I began my conversation with Lauren Euro by asking about merging the forks of writing and climate science. Ever heard of eco-criticism? Well, Lauren will tell you about it. I went to Davidson College, and they didn't have a creative writing major, but I took lots of creative writing workshops there, and I was a English major, and I actually did a creative thesis that was a collection of linked short stories there. And then I went the more academic route for my graduate studies. It's still a literature degree, but it was with an environmental focus. And at the time, it was one of the only programs that you could get your master's specifically in environmental. It's, it's called eco-criticism. And it was, it's in Reno. So I moved out to Nevada. And I, I was doing this more theoretical degree that was literary criticism. But then I ended up doing a creative project for my thesis there as well that was the the first draft of this novel. So it was cool. They let me do that because there was this more environmental f- theme to the book. How did you want to marry up your interest in writing and literature criticism with I- environmental work? W- what was the bridge for you between the two? So, I mean, I have known that I wanted to write as long as I've had consciousness pretty much like it was just my it was just in there you know I I didn't that was never really a question it just was part of who I knew myself to be for a very long time but it was in college and just after college that I started getting more of an awareness of just the environmental crisis that we find ourselves in and and the more that I learned about it the more that it just became like so central to the way that I viewed the world. And so I, I knew that my passion was for writing and studying literature. And I knew that this worldview of the, uh, around the environmental crisis was, was something that I also needed to, to keep learning about and, and to, to continue to be involved with in some way. And so I found this program that did both, but inside of that program, like I loved the study and the things that the conversations that we had in those courses during my master's, but 
I'm just a writer. <laughs> I'm just a, I'm yeah. just a creative writer. And so the, what came out was a novel. What's interesting to me is that you took this interest in writing and the environment and turned it into fiction. Some people would go into environmental journalism, for instance, and seek out stories and try to expose and shed light on things to wake up a public. You're seeking to do so through fiction. Why? So I think that fictional stories can do something different than nonfiction. And I just have always felt drawn to that. That's where kind of my creative curiosity takes me is toward the specifically speculative fiction, the things that speculative fiction uniquely can do. Can you define <clears throat> speculative fiction? Yes. Speculative fiction is a really big umbrella term, and it encompasses fantasy and science fiction, really anything that is that doesn't fall within the realm of realistic fiction. And it's a term that Ursula Le Guin really liked. She thought it was just a better way of describing this huge body of fiction, which has similarities, than dividing it up into these different subcategories, because there can be overlap between the two. And I call mine speculative fiction because it does have some science fiction elements. It also has little glimmers of magical realism. So it's not entirely in one or the other. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you chose this form rather than realistic fiction mm -hmm. to shed light on real issues. I would think that'd be tricky when you're stepping into a fantasy realm and a futuristic realm. To some degree, uh, there, there'd be the risk of losing a sense of realism with your reader on relating to what's happening here on Earth in the here and now. Totally. And so there's actually a literary critic, his name is Amitav Ghosh, and he wrote a book making that exact argument. It's called The Great Derangement, and it's gotten a lot of pushback by people in the speculative kind of fiction world, but it's a valid argument to, to make. The climate crisis is real. If we make it out to be a fantastical story, does that make it feel less serious? And I don't think it does. I think that there are things that realistic fiction, I'm not saying there shouldn't be realistic novels <laughs> about. Of course. But I think there's space also for the speculative because to me, the speculative does a couple of things that are unique. I'm going to get a little in the weeds with some literary terms, but I'll try to define them as I go. So there is another literary critic. His name is Timothy Morton, and I find his stuff to be so compelling. And he came up with this term, hyperobject. And a hyperobject, according to his definition, is something that spans space and time and that just touches everything in a way that it's like... It's bigger than an, an ordinary object. So he, he classifies climate change as a hyper object. He also classifies atmospheric carbon. He cl classifies ocean plastic. Like you can conceive of the idea, but it's almost inconceivable to understand exactly what it means and how much it touches. And so in that way, I think because speculative fiction can span time in a way that realistic fiction can't do as easily. It can give you this kind of double vision where you're existing in the future within the story, you're existing within the present as a reader, and so you are able to see these bigger connections. Yeah, I would think that to a reader it might seem that this issue or problem that they can relate to in real time, that it's being portrayed in this futuristic space, wow, that's the impact of this here and now, that it's still having an impact on this future world. Yeah, and when you're writing a near future world, you're not necessarily predicting what's going to happen. You're trying to shed light on what's happening now. At least I am. The novel is set in a near future world. And um, it's an undefined, it's an undefined near future. Right. World. I don't give a date. Right. I, you don't know exactly how far in the future is, but it's not, we're not in space. We're not like traveling to stars and like it. So it's near future in the sense that we're still on the earth and there is more advanced technology, but it's not so far advanced as to make it seem like it's 
hundreds of years in the future. But yeah, I think that in that way, speculative fiction can do things that realistic fiction cannot. And the other piece of that is sometimes the experience of living now, it feels very surreal and it feels a little fantastical and climate change can feel almost like a monster or like a mythical god, something that is all powerful, is unpredictable, is menacing, and is and, and you don't know what's going to happen. And that is something that I think speculative fiction can pull out of a reader is that experience and, and it could resonate maybe a little bit in a truer way, even though it's less realistic. There are experiences that they feel more fantastical rather than feeling more. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And yet at the same time, your novel doesn't, it's not about climate change. True. So describe it a little bit. You have two central characters, Rumi and Paz. Mm -hmm. And how did you conceive this story that you wanted to tell in a way that was story driven rather than issue driven? The novel is set in, it, it's never specifically named, but it's pretty easy to identify that it's set in Chile. And the names of places are slightly changed, but they are based on, the geography is mapped onto a region of Chile that is that goes from Santiago up to La Serena. And, and so it's a central part of the country. It's a part that I actually, the novel's, the idea for and the spark of the novel came while I was working abroad in Chile. My dad is Cuban, and he came to the U.S. when he was very young, so he doesn't really have much memory of Cuba at all. But when I graduated from even in college and then immediately after college, I just knew that I there was a hole there. There was something that I needed to explore. I needed more connection with that Latina side of myself. And I took it on myself to find ways to live abroad for longer periods of time to really get my Spanish to a place where I felt like I could have really deep conversations with people and it wasn't just a kind of surface understanding. And so one of those opportunities was this freelance travel writing job that I got in Chile and it was the first time that I'd ever been there. And I was covering the region essentially that's covered in the book. You already know The Overlook brings you stories and voices from across the city. Now we also bring you First Look. It's a new daily newsletter that brings you the news headlines from all over Asheville. You can scan it at a glance and see if there's something you've missed or just need to know more about. No ads disguised as stories, just the headlines in a quick, easy read. Get the First Look newsletter for free at podavl.com slash newsletter. Did you know that you wanted to write about Chile and that region before you had the story down? Yeah, so the kind of origin of where the idea came from, that time in Chile was exactly what I dreamed it to be. I was able to have these incredible mind-opening conversations with Chileans that I met just about a whole range of things, poetry and music. And it was interesting. Chileans really wanted to dig deep into this shared, fraught political history that the U.S. and Chile share. And it was something I I was embarrassed at the time, but like, I didn't know very much about that there. And, and I've since read a lot more about it, but it was something that was new to me. And so when I came back to the U.S. after I was done with that little gig, I had this dream. And in the dream, it was this version of this city where I'd spent most of my time, Valparaíso, which is pretty close to Santiago. It's an amazing city. Everyone should go. 
the dream that I had was of that city, but it was transformed in this ominous way. It was a dream that just sank its teeth into me and I could not let it go. I wrote down everything I remembered about the dream and the feelings that I had in the dream. Nothing really happened. It was just me moving through this space. And so the questions I had were were like, how did this city that I knew that was so bright and wonderful and full of life turn into this more ominous, dangerous place? What happened? What other forces were at play that would make that happen and who lives there. And I came up with these two characters, Rumi and Paz. Paz being from this transformed city that I've, in the book I call Paraiso. And then Rumi coming from this walled in city of Saint Iago, which is a a transformed version of Santiago. And you call them in your book, the high city and the low city. Upper city and Uh, lower city. Upper city and lower city, which very much plays to class, right? (laughs) Completely. So it's very obvious. (laughs) That is a complete, that that is, yeah, there's no, no disguising that the book is definitely dealing with issues of class and inequality for sure. So you had that. And then how did you go about then uh, taking this, what happened in this dream and knowing you were going to write about this place and try to mine what you had known as a beautiful city and then mining this dark dream. How did that all spin out for you? The process, I'm slow. I wouldn't call myself like, at least at the outset, a plotter that who outlines everything. It was more asking myself questions and then feeling what felt true. Who lives in this transformed city? Oh, it's this girl. What is her life like? What does she want? Who does she fear? Who does she aspire to be? And so asking those questions made me realize, oh, these are all of the different forces at work in this place. And the same with Rumi in in his upper city. Who is he? What would it be like to live in a city where you'd never seen outside of the walls? How would that feel to know that there were people outside of the walls and you didn't know anything about them and you weren't even allowed to mention them. What would that create in you if you were just turning 16? Yeah, you just answered a question or got to a question I wanted to ask why you set it as a young adult novel. These people could have been any age. You could have Mm -hmm. started. Why young adult? It wasn't a top down decision. It was the characters that came to me and the story that came out of it. And as I was writing it, as I realized how these two characters would come together, what forces would bring them from these very different worlds, what would bring them together, it became clear that I was definitely telling a kind of coming of age story where each of them has to make their own decisions about the direction their lives will take. And it's the first time that they've made such monumental decisions and each one is making a different decision that is, it, it's life altering and even life threatening. <laughs> and that sort of coming of age narrative just, it felt like it had to be for a young audience. And in thinking of it retrospectively, Actively, that it is a young adult novel because I think that stories like this that, that kind of tell the story of characters living on the other side of a world that is transformed for a reader who's looking into their future and seeing a world that's probably going to look a lot different or in some ways be it's an uncertain future that they're looking into. Hopefully it's not the future that I've written, but seeing characters who take it upon themselves to find their own agency, find their own voice, and make decisions that ring true to what how, how they believe they want to be in the world. I think that's a really neat thing for young readers to, to get to experience. You said the novel is written in English, but yet there's a lot of Spanish, at least in dialogue, that mm-hmm. you have. Why did you choose to do it that way? Why not write entirely in Spanish? My Spanish is not up to that task yet to write a novel <laughs> but i knew that i i was setting it in chile paz is a chilean character she completely code switches throughout the novel between speaking with english speakers speaking with spanish speakers speaking a mix it's completely natural for her she's a total 
totally fluid in both languages. And so it didn't make sense for me in terms of creating the texture of her voice to have it be just in English. That's not true to her character. And it also just gives a deeper sense of place, I felt, and a deeper sense of voice to her character. And also Chilean Spanish is unlike any other Spanish. Really? They are hmm. so creative with how they phrase things, especially with how they swear. Like, it is salty. It is fun. It's playful. And that was something, actually, when I went to Chile for the very first time, I felt, okay, I've, I've been living in Spain. I've been practicing my Spanish. I'm, I've got pretty good Spanish. And I got off the plane, and the first thing that someone said to me, I didn't understand a word of it. It was like they were speaking something totally different. It was shocking to me. And I was just flat on my heels. Oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? And it took my ear a little while to tune itself to the different way that Chilean Spanish sounds, the accent, the different mm. different words. And I, I th- and talking to, to Chileans while I was there, I was like, what is going on? Was it tricky to weave in the environmental elements that were your initial motive to begin with? Was it tricky to know how to fuse that in a way that that was effective, but yet didn't dominate your story? No, because I don't think it was a motive. I think I had the story and also I had those feelings and anxieties and uncertainties in myself and they just naturally became part of the story and part of the fabric of the world that was being created. I didn't sit down and say, I want to write a book that talks about climate change and has this agenda and this is the story that I'm going to map onto that agenda. It was, I have this idea for this story. I have these characters. I'm figuring out how their world came to be and how they come together and what the arc of their story is. And a climate-altered world is just the backdrop of their reality. It was never not going to be there. Do you know what I mean? Because it was part of the questions that I was asking about the world at the time that I was writing the book, still asking those questions. And I'm just trying to say that it wasn't like a top-down agenda for, I want this book to say this and to have this message. It, was, it felt much more organic than that. Did anything come up for you in the process of writing this or any revelation that, whether it manifested it on the page or not, that kind of imprinted on you in this process? I'm going to need to take a second to think about that one. Okay, so this is really my first time considering this. So I'm it's a rough draft idea. That's great. But so when I originally wrote the story, it had a certain ending. And I felt sad about that ending. <laughs> or I felt like it was all that I could come up with for how the story had to end. And I didn't want it to have to end that way. And so as I was revising and really trying to think about because when you're writing us when you're writing a story you have you, at, at a certain point it's not entirely in your control to do one thing or another you've written characters and those characters have to be true to each other or true, true to themselves and the world has to be the world you've made otherwise it feels false or it feels deus ex machina kind of thing of oh how did that even that doesn't ring true to me as a reader I knew that there were, I, I was under certain constraints, but I was, as I was writing, I started really think, trying to ask myself, what do I think is the power of story itself? Can story actually change the world? Like asking myself deeply that, do, can story change anything? Or is it, how important do I, as a writer, really think that stories are? And my realization was, extremely important. You had that question while writing. While I was revising. And so there's actually a third narrative voice that came midway through the revising process. It wasn't that narrative voice was not in the original story. That character was in the original story, but not as a narrative voice. And that is the character of the storyteller. And so there are these mythic feeling stories that happen throughout the novel and there are moments where the storyteller does appear 
herself in the story. To get to your original question, I could only have the ending of the novel be different if I changed my own relationship to story and the power of story. And this character was a way in to be able to change the relationship that the novel has to story itself. So that's a little enigmatic, but it is. And it's, <laughs> yeah, it's unclear how that, how did that manifest? It seems like in a way that's trying to acknowledge that you don't control this, that your characters do. The story is unfolding in a way that you, it sounds like when you felt your own hand as a writer being too strong in this, you saw that and, and in the revision tried to pull back. Yeah, yeah. I knew that the story that I had created, to me, it was only able to end in one way. And I wasn't fully satisfied with that ending. And so this other narrative voice of the storyteller gave me power within the story that I didn't have originally as the author. So your book, it seems, without giving away endings, it seems that there's some open ending to it that it can continue. Mm. <clears throat> Do you have plans to continue with the, this thread, this location, and one or more of these characters? The book is standalone in terms of the, the book deal. Like, it doesn't, it's not a series. But I do have some ideas brewing for ways to not only continue the story from this novel, but also to expand on some of the stories of some of the other characters and maybe take it into some different timelines. There's a backstory to the novel that involves this event called The Breach, and that is a moment that I would like to write about. That particular time period and the characters that went through that, I think that would be a really interesting thing to write. So this past year, the human baby and the book baby, bringing that into the world, it's an undertaking. And so I have had all of my brain space occupied in with those two, those two universes. Universes, yeah. And but it, it, I'm just now finding those little tingling spots in my brain that are like, ooh, here's a story. And so I think that what I just mentioned is what I'll start working on next and just see where it takes me. Lauren Yero launches her book, Under This Forgetful Sky, with an August 1st event at Malaprop's Books in Asheville. Our new First Look newsletter gives you just a handful of daily headlines from around the local media landscape to get you on your morning. We also have a weekly newsletter devoted to all things The Overlook that hits you every Friday. Both are free and available at podavl.com slash newsletter. And please support the show by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash The Overlook Podcast. Today's conversation happened inside the BB Theater in downtown Asheville, which owners Susan and Giles Collard have been so gracious enough to open to me to record my interviews. Our theme music for The Overlook, Maker's Song, comes courtesy of the Asheville band The Resonant Rogues. The Overlook is a production of Podcast Asheville. New episodes are available every Monday through Thursday morning. I'm Matt Pikin, and I'll see you on the next episode of The Overlook. <laughs>